Well, welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the session. Uh, the title is IoT Device Regulation Compliance in Industrial Environments. Complicated title, and I'm going to break it down a little bit for you uh, from my personal experience. So for four years, uh, I've uh, worked in two startups. Uh, first one for two and a half years, the second one for one and a half years. Later one closed, unfortunately, down. Um, within this time, I was involved in shipping uh, three products. Uh, one was the barcode scanner um, that is attached to a glove, and another one is a logistics tracking solution where the glove application consists of two devices, and we also had two uh, different um, SOPs, uh, sort of productions. Um, so we went through this process, uh, I went through this process three times. And obviously, for, for clarification, we, had, we were European-based uh, companies at the time, and um, we had customers in Europe. So the agenda for this is there's three columns. Uh, there's the norms, so um, where does it come from, uh, what affects uh, which product, um, and I'm going to a little bit into detail of what, um, uh, what comes from it, so what I have to be aware of um, as, a, as to how, how these norms function and, and what they are. Uh, the third, uh, second column is uh, the project, so how is this going to um, affect me in the project along the line, or should I know in advance what's um, happening along the way? And third column is the customer, uh, because the customer is always involved, uh, whether it's an uh, in industry, so a B2B or a B2C um, product, a uh, customer is always there and is interfering, so what's happening on there? By the way, if you have any questions in between, um, just, um, just uh, raise your hand. Uh, and I can answer it also. So what regulations apply? In Europe we have uh, what's called CE. Uh, I'm not going to attempt um, the, the French spelling here, uh, but what that is, it's actually an, um, it's not what it actually stands for. The CE is not defined, but uh, the confirmation at the compliance in Europe with certain regulations is what is understand, understood. And uh, what this defines is certain product ca categories in the European economic area. Uh, so every product you're going to sell in Europe um, is going to have to comply with these regulations. Um, if you are in, um, a company out of the, uh, outside of the European Union and you want to sell inside of Europe, you're going to have to comply either way. Either your, um, your, your, your um, representative in Europe or um, your importer. Like if you're going to import products, you want to have to make sure these devices comply with the CE. One of those uh, is electromagnetic compatibility, short EMC. Uh, what this makes sure is it, um, it shows that the device uh, is not going to destroy itself uh, due to electromagnetic interference. Uh, you're going to probably see that during development. But most importantly, uh, the EMC testing makes sure that it doesn't interfere with other devices uh, from probably the same category or even other uh, categories of devices. So for example, your phone um, it hopefully works if there's also a, a, a radio uh, in the room, right? Product safety, which of course involves, for example, that um, the device should not burn down, something like that, but also most commonly uh, human safety, so that no humans um, are harmed in the process. There's regulations for that. LVD stands for low voltage devices, by the way, this is what I mostly worked on. And then there's the radio equipment directive, uh, RED. Um, the shorthand is, or I think um, register ID is 2014 uh, 53 EU. Um, I think this is when, when it was finished and it is in effect, I'm not sure when it was uh, in effect, 2017, 2018, but it is in effect now. And the radio equipment directive attempts to regulate uh, the use of radio spectrum all across Europe, uh, all across, across all devices. Uh, so if you have a radio device, you're probably going to need to read the RED and accordingly, uh, the according standards. So for example, a Wi-Fi device uh, will have to comply with these four norms, um, the electrical safety, the human safety, electromagnetic um, compatibility, and the radio standard. Um, for example, like, like, and each of these uh, regulations is maybe a hundreds or maybe a couple of thousands of pages, 
right? Uh, and the, the thing is, um, you're not gonna have to comply with all of these because these regulations are for certain product categories and even they, only, only uh, some of them will apply to your certain use case. Right? So for example, um, you're not gonna have to comply with uh, devices or with regulations in the five gigahertz band when you have uh, 2.4 gigahertz or sub-gigahertz device. Another norm uh, that's there is called IP. Um, it is um, regulating the intrusion of liquids and solids uh, in, into a case of a device. This is, is to my best knowledge, not covered uh, by the CE, but you probably wanna, wanna have that because um, either your device is, out, is working in the outside or even the inside. Uh, in the industry, you sometimes have gaseous or, or dusty environments. Um, or you have even an underwater sensor or something like that, so you wanna make sure your device is actually safe of uh, intrusion of liquids and solids. Um, these testings are usually done in pressure chambers, for example, liquid tanks, water, water hoses, <laughs> and it's really that, right? Uh, the IP declaration, the IP54 or 67, uh, what you see here as a number, um, is actually the first number defines um, the, the, solid, uh, the solid category, so the, the level of solid intrusion, and the second number is defining the level of liquid intrusion. Um, and the higher the number, the smaller the particle or the higher the pressure uh, before water goes into the device. Another one is the IK, where I think K stands for kinetic, which explains it's uh, you're testing for impact onto the device. Um, there's 10 categories, IK101 um, to IK10. And basically w what it means is um, the higher the number, the more energy you're gonna hit your device, right? So for example, if you have a sensor um, in, in an environment where there's forklifts around and there's a serious consideration that these forklifts might drive into your sensors, then you probably wanna have to test the IK regulation and, and, and think about, okay, how hard is this forklift maybe gonna hit my device? And you wanna test for it to make sure uh, to, 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 to be able to explain to your customer, yes, my device is not gonna break in your environment. Another one, um, rarer, but um, also there is X, explosive um, regulation. So for example, devices near flammable material, as I said, in chemical industries, for example, uh, you wanna have to comply with that. Um, why is that? Well, your device uh, is a possible factor of risk in these environments and you have to make sure that it is not that. Um, the, these, these companies usually wanna make sure that your device is um, able to sustain very high temperatures. Or maybe even an example for sensors is that um, sensors have to be filled with um, some materials so that uh, there's actually no air inside the casing. So in case someone explodes around it, um, it doesn't get, uh, it, it doesn't make it worse. For example, if there's a battery device and a lithium battery starts fire and this fire, because it's, it's at such a high degree, it's gonna uh, inflame much more uh, worse things in the, in, in the warehouse. So what do you wanna have to do uh, there? Um, with these norms? Well, your obligation is uh, to test for it and to develop for it, right? So you have to comply as a manufacturer, as a developer with these norms. There's no institute or something that does that for you and then says, yes, this guy is uh, compliant with it. You have to do it. So it's your obligation to actually declare and label your devices accordingly. Like there's no institution that does it for you. So you're gonna have to name the manufacturer, the device name, electrical information, serial number, disposal and environmental information on the case, readable. It has to be readable, it's, it's, not, it, it's, it's not allowed, for example, to have a small barcode on there and all the information is encoded in there. No, it has to be a readable, a readable label. Funny thing is there's actually no, it's, it's not defined um, which font you're gonna have to use or how the contrast of the colors have to be for, uh, of, the, of the label, but there has to be one. So basically common sense applies and um, if, you're, if your testing bureau says, yeah, okay, it's, this label is not enough, you have to do better or a regulation um, guy. 
Which brings me to another point. Um, if you build a product and you're going to buy other things to, to build it, basically, you want to get some components, um, for example, it, it starts with very, very simple things like um, um, a power outlet, for example, right? Or just a case, basically. And if you buy that in, in outside of Europe, um, and even inside of Europe, you have to make sure, you have to make sure that it is in compliance with CE. You have to get the documents uh, from the manufacturer of the devices you buy before you buy your own, uh, before you sell your own product uh, further in Europe. That, this leads uh, to, to, to a lot more tasks that, you, uh, that, that, that we, for example, uh, didn't anticipate in the beginning. Like, yeah, you're going to buy all these things, but you actually need these documents uh, if you're going to say you are CE compliant, you need these documents from your suppliers. And obviously, you need to retain all these documents, um, if I'm not mistaken, at least for 10 years. Um, and after 10 years, the, the, when the product goes off market, to actually, because um, if there's an incident, you have to answer for it and show that you actually did the testing. Okay, let me, let me, let me add another um, point here. Oh, no, we, we continue. So the project. Um, Obviously, it affects the roadmap, right? And CE testing is, is, is not a, a simple thing. Um, and what we did, for example, we had always two phases of uh, testing. One was uh, pre-testing, pre-compliance, so to speak, and actual compliance testing. Uh, the difference is that uh, initially we did some very important tests, tests that may fail, especially tests that may involve uh, changes in hardware, um, especially in hardware, um, or in software, even in lower layers uh, in the software in embedded devices. And uh, so we had these, the first deadline basically, and then there's a second deadline. And the first testing is obviously uh, very short and it costs less. And the actual compliance testing with your tests that you didn't, um, where you didn't have your full test protocol, um, it's obviously gonna take much longer, a couple of weeks, um, and it's much more expensive and probably needs more preparation. Yeah, because late hardware changes are problematic. Um, everyone knows that because we're talking embedded devices here and we have basically a, a development cycle and these cycles can take ideally a couple of weeks, but more likely uh, multiple months, um, if not a year. Um, so you better be aware that you have to re-certify when you yourself do changes to there and, and you have to do it in two, you should do it in two stages because if you fail the compliance testing, you have to do it all over again and you still pay. Which brings me to the cost. Um, so these costs are not, not very, uh, very cheap, um, especially as a startup. Uh, it's actually a considerable amount of money you have to take uh, into your hands there. It's at least five digits, so 10 to 20,000 per device, uh, very simple devices to be fair, um, because um, each one of these tests, uh, which usually involves uh, measurement equipment, someone being there, and actually a laboratory, uh, usually costs um, two to 3,000 euro. Uh, it varies obviously, but these are not uh, affordable tests. So obviously you don't wanna do it all over again. During some of these tests, your devices are actually destroyed. Uh, remember the IK test, the kinetic tests of impact into your device, these devices are gone. Um, you wanna destroy them to see the limit of the case, right? It's not like you, you hammer it and then are the devices fine, but you wanna, wanna know wh where's the limit to actually say, okay, this type of impact is gonna destroy the device so you can exclude certain liability cases, right? And obviously you don't wanna buy your own test equipment. If you say, oh, I'm gonna do it all on my own, if it's that complicated, no, you don't, um, because these, some of these devices cost in the multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, and rarely, especially as a startup, you can afford that. Manpower. So initially, I, um, in my first project, we, we severely underestimated the manpower that is necessary for compliance uh, testing, um, especially preparation. Um, in the second um, product, we did it a lot better. And what we did was we have to write manuals for the test lab because these guys have to use your device, right? 
very simple also. I mean, it has to be understandable. It's like you write a manual, right, and you want the guy to, to be able to understand how this device is supposed to work. So and, and just as that, the guys in the labs want to have to do that. Writing your test code and documentation, because some of these tests uh, will probably not be the same that you already have in your unit tests or, or end of line testing. Um, so you probably have to be, you're going to have to write a separate test code and separate documentation for that. I had one of my engineers, we were five people in the, in the second company. Uh, one of my engineers worked um, at least two months solely on the preparation of the software and the, the manuals. And this was a simple product. Of course, you have to build and test, uh, produce the test hardware, right? So if you did, don't have prototypes yet, you're going to have to build them. Um, either by hand or if you have an embedded device, you're going to have to have a, a, a small uh, test batch. Um, also in the test lab, you probably want to be there uh, to answer questions at least one, of two, one or two days um, because this just, especially if your manuals are not that great, uh, you're going to have to send someone there and this is, um, yeah, what, one, two days, maybe a week, uh, unlikely, but uh, just to answer some questions and introduce everyone to the, to the tools. And obviously uh, the coordination because um, these labs are going to have their own test routines. Uh, they're they're going to they they have their uh, yeah their routines, and you want to talk to them how they want to see the information coming out of the device. What do they want? What information do they need? What's what's common for them? And um, this brings me to the tech. So maybe you need some accessible debug IOs that you didn't think of in the first place um, because you need some information uh, out of your device. Maybe you need to adapt your software architecture even because um, your device is usually in low power and not used to continually output certain, um, certain um, debug information. You're going to have to have uh, mode switches, physical mode switches, for example. It, it made things very easy for us, for example, because with these physical mode switches connect to GPIOs uh, on the hardware we were able to just switch operating modes of the radio, for example, and that made things much easier for us uh, in testing. Yeah, and this basically is uh, external control tooling. Um, the mode switches, on the other hand, or the, or the control tools are one thing, the other one is the visualization. Uh, in, in testing, you usually have your test routines and your test requirements um, and the acceptance criteria. And these acceptance criteria are basically, basically then visualized as red or green. So what you have to do is actually project or, or implement all these acceptance criteria into your software, whether it is the external control tooling or your embedded software on its own, because um, you're not going to have that in your application, um, outputting at what uh, power you're currently transmitting, for example. Uh, it was not there in the debug output initially. Or your, or your, or the data at all. Like for example, just outputting the the transmit receive data on some some debug console. Um, yeah, was just not there. Which brings me to the customer. The customer. And this is actually very important, and we didn't see that in the beginning. It may require uh, additional compliance. For example, for internal frequency band regulation, which completely threw us off the table, uh, like like uh, off the feet. It's like okay, we have this these uh, standards, these requirements uh, in in the compliance standards, but here we have a customer who actually has their own regulation unit actually inside the company. It was a fairly large uh, customer, to be fair, but still. So they didn't want to let us ship uh, or roll out our product before we didn't comply with their own standards and they actually had their own testing offices uh, on site. Yeah, we were quite surprised by that. A specific example was that. He wanted us to only transmit on one channel. Uh, it was a sub gigahertz, uh, in a sub gigahertz band. So what you usually do there is frequency hopping. Um, because if you if you transmit a certain amount of data, you want to uh, switch the channels because one channel is heavily restricted in duty cycling, so in, in, in actual transmit time there. So you cannot send a lot of a lot of data on these uh, channels usually. So what that means is you have to change your module dri and driver implementation, right? And this is very low-level stuff. 
Uh, you don't want to fiddle around there, especially not in the, at the end of your uh, development cycle when you don't want to change these types of things. So if our problem leads that to, it means reduced transmit time. With one channel, we can, can only transmit so much, so much data. Um, because in the regulation it says, uh, you can only transmit 0.1% uh, of an hour or something like that. Which leads to redevelopment of the actual implementation and retesting of the CE certification, or if you want to roll out also to other customers with this feature. If not, you can say, okay, we develop this feature for you, you do the testing and that's it. But in general, it means another testing cycle because before you can roll out to this customer. And since it's low level changes, it's probably not going to be a lot of fun um, and um, yeah, in, in general, not probably going to um, change your perspective on the roadmap a little bit. The next example is integration. For example, the question was, uh, can we have Wi-Fi system or API access? It's not, nothing unusual, especially in IoT or in sensor data, that you want to somehow process this data. So this data has to be actually collected somewhere. So why not use the infrastructure at the customer? He says, yeah, in six months. Well, in six months, we're probably bankrupt as a startup. Uh, and we don't have time to wait for that because then we're going to have another integration project or another, another customer project. Um, too bad. Or what we heard, the customer has another device on the shelf for testing. And we said, oh, yeah, how did it go with that device? We said, yeah, it's on the shelf for six months waiting for testing. <laughs> well, we don't want to, uh, we also don't want to uh, wait for six months. We want to test now. So what this means is, uh, in, we didn't actually have to, um, in, in it, to be able to comply with certain standards or to comply with the actual regulations or even the customer's own regulations, you have to get there. You have to know what the, what the customer wants and, and what the customer's timeline is. And this was actual kind of pioneering work at the time because um, the customers were not used to these short, uh, to these short development cycles and, um, that we needed as a startup. Uh, and especially in hardware, uh, it's very difficult to have a lot of in, in iterations because you have this very little money for a very expensive hardware product and you don't, you want to wanna earn money with it as soon as possible and not wait a year until you get Wi-Fi access or half a year. I mean, they have, they have their provisioning uh, processes, for example, for, for uh, certificates or for Wi-Fi um, tokens, um, API access. Sometimes even, uh, one customer said, yeah, you want to you wanna collect this data, this data should go to the cloud. Well, no, this data doesn't leave the, ca the, the site. <laughs> but with IoT, well, it's this internet of things. You want to somehow process this data somewhere. You not, don't want to get dependent on this one customer because this ends in just uh, uh, tailoring your product completely to the customer, right? In, uh, to one customer, assuming you have multiple customers, uh, for example, and, and a bigger market. Can we use Bluetooth? 2.4 gigahertz. Now it's frequencies overlap with Wi-Fi. And obviously, <laughs> it was also not very fun because they also uh, regulated their own Wi-Fi bands. They separated the Wi-Fi for, for, separate, for different devices, for different um, 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 areas across the, across the manufacturing site. And it was completely regulated just as the single band in a sub gigahertz. It was, uh, to me, it was crazy. So it, it was all, there were all these standards and these things I could see that were in the open, but once you talk to the customer, that suddenly there's, uh, there's these uh, multiple additional requirements you have to fulfill that come on top of this uh, whole compliance um, topic. Human factor. The worker council once blocked our product uh, because they didn't want us to, to track their um, employees. Um, what I want to say with this is uh, if you want to build a product and you want to be compliant with uh, certain standards, it's not only about um, technical aspects, but it's all in this case, uh, let's say about human, uh, human rights. Um, this was an actual problem and it delayed the project for I think another one or two months. The innovation department blocks your product because you were too innovative and that idea didn't come from them. Actually happened. 
worker blocks your product. Because we have an industry product, we're usually talking to sales representatives, to managers, to team leads. But who's actually using our product? Maybe they didn't even see our product and, and they say, no, it's, it's, it doesn't, doesn't work, it's annoying, and, and he just doesn't use it, right? Because generally it can be his choice to use it or not. So what I want to say with this is to get everyone on board, involve as many key roles as possible. It's not enough to just talk to the sales representative, especially if it goes uh, in the direction of regulation, whether it be technical or, as we saw, uh, about regulation within the company. Do not rely on one person to know everything. For the Wi-Fi guy, for example, there's a separate apartment, uh, and, and, and until you know the name of this guy, there may pass one or two weeks uh, until you get actual information on why IT complains about interference uh, between Bluetooth and Wi-Fi, for example. That takes time. Which brings me to my conclusion. The technical aspects is uh, only one of many. Um, there is the self-declaration, so you cannot rely on someone else to do the testing for you and then say you are compliant. I mean, of course, you can externalize the, the testing, but still, you have to declare you are CE compliant. The cost and time of product availability is heavily affected along all, um, everywhere. So basically, it's widening a bit the picture here to not only, f let's not only focus on CE compliance, but actually, it goes to the customer, it widens the, the view a bit to the product view. The customer's industry testing and the product design is most definitely affected uh, by compliance. Uh, for example, if uh, the X testing, for example, um, you cannot use an empty uh, case. Uh, if there's a battery inside, you wanna have to fill it. Quality assurance is more important than ever, especially as a, as a startup. Uh, you will focus more on the uh, important things that bring money. But uh, compliance with regulations is exactly the opposite, right? You have to be very accurate with everything. You t have to test everything because eventually you are liable, is what it means. So this brings quality assurance to the table very early in, uh, in, in the product cycle. Basically means compliance testing is a separate project, right? In the first startup, as I said, we uh, didn't have um, all these points in mind, but and and then everything on the way there surprised us: the customer, the regulations themselves, uh, the, the the implementation into the software. There, um, it is an actual separate project. In the second company, we managed to to plan for that in advance, um, and we we were able to still have a product within one year that is fully CE certified. And yeah, this is my conclusion. So uh, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Yes, when I have the microphone. I would have a question because I'm in a way a few steps behind you. So in a startup trying uh, to develop uh, some products and I'm curious about this um, CE compliance. I know there are laboratories which can run all the tests for you, but this is in the range of five digits, <laughs> very expensive. I also found in some sources that uh, this is a kind of testing that uh, the manufacturer can do by himself. Is this the case? Can it be managed? What's your experience here? Well, uh, if you wanna test your product on your own, you will have to afford all the testing equipment. So you still will need to uh, get information about what regulations comply. We, for example, got a lot of that information from testing bureaus, from offices that helped us with that. And um, then it, it depends if you have a radio device, I don't think you can afford uh, the, the test equipment. Um, yeah, I have a radio device. It's, uh, it happens to be a Bluetooth Low Energy but it's built around a certified module. So I would assume this is propagated to the complete system because I'm not modifying anything there. I'm just putting some extra software. Yeah, so if you, we also had the case where um, we questioned ourselves, should we use a pre-certified module? And what I heard at least, um, what we decided to still test on our own because 
apparently it is not enough to, to buy a pre-certified module to be able to declare it, especially if it's that heavily integrated uh, into the hardware. So if you buy, for example, an, um, um, a module that is soldered onto the hardware and you wanna, wanna say your device is, so this, this uh, device is compliant, uh, you, we still did all the radio testing with the lab, even though we knew we we're likely not gonna exceed the limits. With Bluetooth, um, I know of a, of a different case with Bluetooth there, you can get a lot of the regulation uh, ticked off by using pre-certified modules and um, proper so uh, software stacks, for example. In Zephyr, for example, there is, a, there is a Bluetooth stack in there, and I think one of the chip vendors was able to pre-certify their software stack for that. So, and, and in this case, I heard it worked. So for, for them, um, compliance, especially also uh, saying their product is a Bluetooth product, got very affordable. Um, but either way, you're gonna have to talk to the, to the, to the testing labs, at least that's what we did, and uh, be able to afford the test equipment, which is in most cases in radio testing not that no, <laughs> I, I don't want to go that path. Okay, and yeah. another question would be, um, when you develop a product, you usually start with uh, prototypes, you try to uh, a small batch of feasibility, see how it's working, collect learnings and feedback from the customer, and then you go for the final product. I, my assumption would be that for the feasibility for prototyping, it's okay to go without any testing, any compliance. But of course you have to consider this for the final product. Is this the case or uh, there are also limits or points so where I should pay attention to? Did I, did I, did I get that correct? So, so what, you're, what you're asking was the, um, whether for testing you already need to be fully compliant. Yeah. Um, yeah, that depends on the customer. As I said, the, the, with, with CE um, that never was a problem, but especially with the in-house compliance or in-house regulations with the, with the frequency bands, that was a big problem. For sure, in your case, that's so they, very they special. Did not, they did not let us uh, use our product in there before we, were, before we went through their testing. But eventually, it was such a big project that um, yeah, we, it was a separate feature. We decided only to ship to this customer, and then we had enough money and time to, uh, to actually build that. So that was an actual side project. Okay. Did Thank that you. answer your question? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Um, so, what happens if you're uh, if you are not CE compliant? Uh, can you talk about uh, the liability side of things? If you do take a product to market, which is uh, if you're something that you overlook, or if you're not even uh, CE approved, uh, what 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 happened? Do you know about the liability? What what are the consequences? What what is uh, the worst case? So the worst case, I think, is um, if, 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 if a site burns down and hundreds of people die <laughs> and, you yeah. didn't, and you didn't test for it. I mean, this, this testing is not only to be compliant with the regulations that some people thought of because they thought it's, uh, it's important, but it's, it's, uh, this testing is actually important, especially in the human safety part. Uh, where, there's actual, um, where there's actual situations or, or tests uh, that show your device is uh, not harmful for the environment, right? So the, the, the and, and what happens if you're not CE compliant? Well, that, that's not sure if someone can sue you. Um, or, or I, th I think it's still possible to sell the product, um, but I'm not sure if, if some, some in institution from the EU is gonna call you or something, I don't know about that. But um, I'm seeing it more from the, uh, from the personal responsibility perspective where you actually want to make sure your product doesn't harm anyone. And it does, I mean, this is basically all that's for. Um, the, the tests are very, in my opinion, very important, especially those regarding human safety, and you want to wanna do them um, regardless uh, of, of your opinion or whether, whether or your goal whether to be CE compliant or not. Um, but still, as far as I know, and the regulation says uh, is, that all products have to be compliant with these standards, and sooner or later, someone is probably going to ask you to, to do the testing. Thank you. Welcome. Thanks. Um, okay. When I lately looked for the actual norms I have to comply to, or my product has to comply to, there's a r large zoo of norms you can normally choose from, e.g., for for the EMC part. 
Well, you have to think about what is for product, and maybe there are even multiple norms that fit that. Um, when I researched that, I found companies that sell you a study to classify your product to, to the norms. Do you have any experience with that? Did I get the, the question right? Is the, where to actually get all the information, which product category I'm in, and which norms apply to myself? Um, yeah, that's one part, and the other part is, um, do, do you have any experience with external companies doing this uh, research for you? Ah, yeah, it, basically uh, the, the answer is, it, it, it was a mix. Uh, on the one hand, we read the regulations ourselves, mm -hmm. that was a lot of work, uh, and on the other hand, we uh, talked to uh, offices, testing offices, testing labs. Um, uh, you're probably also going to get different offers from different labs. Uh, you're gonna, what, what happens is usually with the first time you talk to them, you explain to them what your product is, and they're already going to say, okay, this is uh, probably what you want to test or not. I mean, still, it's your obligation to, to tell them what to test. Um, but most of that information was we gathered was uh, from these uh, talks, uh, also to other sister companies, for example, or to, to, to companies having similar uh, products. Um, and we just asked them which norms did you comply with and what, what you, did you actually test and maybe where. So that, that, that this, this was the, the, the combination. I'm, I'm not aware of um, a very uh, specific dis text that describes a list of the norms for, for certain, for certain yeah. products. Yeah, that, that sounds a lot like that, what we do too. So yeah. it feels good to know that. <laughs> Reading and talking. Oh. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Thank you. Another question. Have you done any uh, UL testing as sort of for the taking a product that's been CE tested and then apply it to the US market with uh, underwriters labs doing the similar? There are. Um, did I get the question right? Is, or what was the question? Is this a question what applies from CE to the US markets or to FCC? Yeah, taking an existing product that you already have CE. Yeah, that's um, from, from a development and preparation point of view, it's um, it, probably a lot of things overlap uh, from the functionality that's necessary in the hardware and software. Uh, but from a testing perspective, I am not aware that there you can use the, the actual test results. I think you, um, there's, for FCC, for example, there are some countries that only allow testing in their country. Uh, so I, as far as I'm aware, they do all the testing on themselves uh, in, in FCC. Okay. So it's, it's, I, I don't think there's a general answer for, for that because some, some countries wanna, wanna do it themselves and, and on some maybe they allow for, they, they acknowledge your CE and then these and these tests um, are okay. Um, on, uh, from from my so I worked more, I worked on the on the CE testing and what they what they always said is they they uh, encourage us to test everything so and I would assume um, that a similar thing applies to the FCC or if, if you have an FCC product and import it to uh, to the CE market. Um, I think it can get very complicated uh, in in arguing, for example, a technical difference, arguing that uh, your product is compliant with the other, other norm, especially if it's not harmonized. I mean, for example, the, the RAD, uh, the Radio Equipment Directive, is uh, attempts to harmonize the European market, but as far as I know, they're also not yet there. Um, so it's, there, for example, parts missing for five gigahertz. So even there, it, this is, uh, harmonizing the European market is already a challenge uh, currently, and I would not. Uh, I would not say that. That I, or the next step would be okay. It's probably not harmonized across the world. Yeah, it gets more interesting when you add like Brazil and Japan, and yeah. uh, everyone has their own little yes. little tweak yes. to the. <laughs> so, so I, I briefly worked on a project uh, in in the railway industry, and it's it's the same. They they, they went through certifications in every single of the countries. There's there's no not. <laughs> nothing that you can really reuse, especially in, 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 the, in the compliance declaration in these documents um, when, you, when you say, okay, you are CE compliant, you want to have this, 
this report, the test report that says uh, that that tells you all the test results, and you don't want to go into your FCC test results or in your um, other standard test results to show, okay, th this is why we are compliant uh, in Europe. I don't, I don't think this is a good strategy from a from a planning point of view either. Any more questions? Please. Uh, what was the in industry? If you have work for projects in s sub one gigahertz frequency. Sub one gigahertz, yes. Yeah. Yes. So the the GLOV project, uh, we were uh, in the ISM band eight six eight megahertz, and this is what the example was basically with the hopping, where the customer wanted us to only use one one channel, and this was in the ISM band in a sub gigahertz. Uh, you develop the frequency hopping algorithm? No, we no. actually that was that was actually the the pain of wallet. Uh, we bought a pre-certified or, or they declared it certified in the CE market, um, and we had it, it led to a to a to, to a lot of collaboration between us and the radio manufacturer to actually get this feature done, and yeah, it was a lot of work. Um, <laughs> That's why I may, maybe maybe I'm biased because of that, uh, and saying okay, this is a lot of work, and there's a lot of unknowns, especially um, with these customer-specific uh, regulations. But I mean, the the ISM ban in itself is um, um, is unlicensed, so everyone one can use it. So that's probably why they are very prohibitive, prohibitive there too, uh, as in the 2.4 gigahertz example. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? Well, then I thank you for joining the session and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you so much.